might be a good time to start, and I'm sure some people will trickle in, but uh, I'm Lisa Nelson on behalf of the Colloquium Committee, which includes Kevin Antrochitis and Elena Lauder, and as well as, of course, the Udall Center, which is sponsoring this talk. I just wanted to welcome you and to ask if anybody has any announcements or kudos before we turn it over to Elena for the introduction. Um, I would like to kudos uh, Diego Martinez Lugo, who passed his master's thesis with flying colors uh, earlier this week. Um, and it was great to see Tracy Osborne as the co-advisor. And his uh, thesis was on um, Barrio Environmental Justice, uh, Latinx um, Geographies in South Tucson. I, I'm not sure we have the final title, but he did a great job. So congrats, Diego. Thanks, everyone. Um, congratulations to Talia Anderson and Julie Edwards, who both got uh, awards from the Climate Specialty Group of the AAG to help them uh, attend, uh, in some fashion, uh, the AAG meeting uh, this spring. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Any more kudos or announcements? Uh, just one announcement while everybody is here um, it, that uh, Ashante Reese is the speaker on November 6th, um, so a week from today. And this is joint with the Center for Regional uh, Food Studies. Um, so please uh, put that on your calendar, look for announcements, and uh, plan to join us next week for that. OK, well, unless somebody is going to jump in now, I will turn it over to Elena Lauder for introduction of our speaker. Great. Before I get started, I think um, Chris is going to say a few words about the My Arizona. Yeah, thanks so much, everybody. Welcome to the My Arizona Lecture for 2020. I'm Chris Scott. I am faculty in geography and development. I'm also uh, the director at the Udall Center. And it turns out for the last three or four years, uh, the Udall Center has been proud to co-sponsor uh, with the School of Geography, Development, and Environment is my Arizona lecture. Um, this year, that co-sponsorship um, is all due to the efforts of Molly Bryson, our capable and skilled uh, Udall Center Environmental Programs Coordinator. Molly is over there. You will have seen announcements and so forth from her. Thanks, Molly. Um, and in the past, of course, uh, when these are in person and we have a reception and we have an event and so forth, there are other uh, logistical support and financial implications of doing an event like this. But this year, uh, that's not to be the case. Um, there's going to be some virtual uh, get together afterwards that um, grads and others are going to be um, organizing and we hope everybody can participate in. Just a very brief word on the My Arizona Lecture. Um, it features um, topics of interest to Arizona. And so we've had a whole range of talks uh, mostly by U of A faculty, occasionally um, those who may be community members, but who have an affiliation uh, with the university. Um, and um, yeah, without further ado, let me just say it is a pleasure to have um, Scott Warren as our speaker this time. You'll get much more detail from Elena Louder next. But once again, thanks everybody for, for joining. And um, we will try to um, wind up the, the talk part of it in about 35 to 40 minutes, leaving hopefully enough time for some good Q&A, sharing of reflections um, and experiences and so forth um, at the end after Scott's talk. Thank you. Great, thank you, Chris. I'm going to share my screen. Can you all see my screen? All right. Um, Hi everyone, my name is Elena Lauder and I'm a second year PhD student in geography. And I'm really excited and honored to introduce this year's SGDE My Arizona speaker, Dr. Scott Warren. Dr. Warren is a postdoctoral fellow here at University of Arizona in the School of Geography, Development and Environment. He holds a PhD from Arizona State University where he taught for a number of years. Dr. Warren's research interests include cultural and historical geography, the US-Mexico border, the North American Southwest region, and human, human rights. Dr. Warren has written on these topics and some of his publications include A New Kind of Company Town, published in the Journal of Latin American Geography, Borders and the Freedom to Move, published in Progress in Human Geography, 
and in defense of wilderness, policing public borderlands in South Atlantic Quarterly. I could go on about Scott's, Dr. Warren's um, academic accomplishments. However, um, probably more relevant to Dr. Warren's story is his longstanding commitment to humanitarian aid work along the US-Mexico border. He has been volunteering with a humanitarian organization called No More Deaths, along with other humanitarian organizations around the Ajo area for nearly a decade. Dr. Warren has been part of efforts to provide water, food, shelter, and medical aid to people risking their lives crossing the US-Mexico border. His efforts to help alleviate suffering in the borderland and bring attention to inhumane policies have gotten him arrested twice, and he spent much of 2019 in federal court and was recently acquitted of felony charges of harboring and conspiracy, along with other misdemeanor charges. On the screen, you can see some of Dr. Warren's other engaged work around the Ajo area. Um, he's really an amazing combination of scholarly and engaged uh, work, um, along with boots on the ground humanitarian efforts. So with that, I will turn it over to, um, to Dr. Warren. Thanks. Thanks, Elena. And thanks, uh, Chris. And thanks, everyone, for having me here and also for having me um, in the department this year. Um, it really has been delightful to be a part of SGDE. And um, it's fantastic. So um, I'm looking forward to this and also looking forward to stick around for the uh, uh, happy hour at five. So if there's anything that um, you want to ask me that we don't talk about, that I don't present in this talk or it doesn't come up in Q and A, um, feel free to ask me in those less formal settings or get in touch with me, send me an email. Happy to do that. Um, and I also wanna just say that um, <laughs> this moment in time is so intense, obviously, um, and uh, it's, it feels really good to be here in this context. Um, I've been reflecting a lot on the last four years and sort of where I was four years ago uh, as we entered this kind of long, really difficult period of time that's culminating now with the pandemic and everything else that's happening. So it's also good to be in community with y'all in that context as well. Um, and the last, <laughs> the last preface, I suppose, is I also just want to say um, that uh, I, I appreciate and it, it really is an honor that you've invited me to do this and to talk on this topic in particular because this is a room, a virtual room full of people that could be giving this talk um, that have absolutely critical, important things, experiences, perspectives to share about this topic, to share about the border, this region in which we live. Um, and so it is an honor to be here uh, and to be the one doing that. And I hope that folks share their own perspectives through the questions that you might ask or, or observations that you have. I wanna make sure that we leave plenty of time for that and I think we will. Um, I have uh, some images that I wanna show uh, throughout the presentation. Um, so I'll be sharing my screen and showing some of those images. Um, some are mine, some are uh, taken by other photographers. Um, and then otherwise I'll be speaking to you uh, on this topic of absence and loss in the borderland. Um, and I've kind of identified three themes that I wanted to highlight and I'll share them with you now, try to return to them throughout the talk and um, uh, and see what we all have to say about them at the end. Um, but the first one is what I've been feeling lately, especially, which is a real kind of, um, a real sense of grief over the loss of place um, here in the border region. And uh, one that is just being underscored with the construction of the wall right now. Uh, and everything that's happening in Ajo especially surrounding the Hyachid Atom resistance to wall construction, 
and our community members that have been arrested and prosecuted in relation to that. So I guess you could say it's sort of a lamentation about the loss of place in the border. One that is not unique and new to this last four years, but one that seems like it's increased at a kind of industrial scale. And then the other theme that I wanna to touch on really is this one of extraction and extractive industries in the border. I live in Ajo, which is a former copper mining town. And so the traces on the landscapes of that older extraction industry are everywhere. And then of course, now we have this new border industry, relatively new, that also functions in many ways like an extractive industry. And it's striking to me the way these industries, um, you know, use whichever theoretical framework or sort of metaphor works for you, you know, creative destruction or the, the transformation of, of landscape, the reordering of landscape along the lines of, of these particular re, uh, industries and their industrial production. Um, but in one sense at their core, these extractive industries quite literally devour places. Perhaps they destroy them, perhaps they chew them up, they spit something else out. Uh, and so that's part of the loss of place and the lamentation that I'm interested in here in the border region. And then that sort of leads to the last thing, which is this question that I posed in the abstract of the talk, which is sort of where, where does it go next? What happens next for the border uh, that I hope we can all uh, talk about. And I would never want to skip over the grief of the moment, which is important to acknowledge, but there is also a kind of hope and a kind of promise, you know, in the midst of all this destruction. Um, perhaps unwittingly, these extractive industries, um, whether it's an externality uh, to the process or, or whatever the case, they also do create new kinds of, of places uh, in their wake. And so I'm interested in what those possibilities are um, as we move forward and we think about what the future of the borderland looks like. Okay, so um, I'll go ahead and get started here. I have sort of three sets of images to show you. So that'll give you a sense of how we're moving through the, the talk and the ideas. Um, and uh, I'll kind of pull up our first set here. So uh, just give me a second to make this all work. Okay, uh, can you see these images? Can you see the map? Okay, yeah. I'm seeing some head nods. Okay, thanks, yeah, thanks. Uh, and I'm just gonna try and make this um, kind of perfect presentation here. Yeah, let's try it this way. Okay, so I have this map up. Uh, and a few more images, and then I assume you can, oh, we're getting there. Okay. <clears throat> so you should be able to see the map of Southwestern Arizona, Northwestern Sonora here. Uh, and then I think you can still see me talking as I'm going through this. So I wanna introduce you uh, to Ajo, which is where I live. I've lived here for seven years, uh, which is not a long time, <laughs> as locals will tell you. Um, but Ajo is located here in southwestern Arizona. Um, it's sort of history, it's current history is as a, uh, or it's 20th century history is as a uh, copper mining town. It's located in the middle of this kind of mosaic of public and federal lands. The Atham Nation, the Goldwater Range, Cabeza Prieto Oregon Pipe, and lots of BLM land as well. <clears throat> 
uh, for much of Ahu's history, it did kind of function as the border town here because there was not much else right on the border adjacent to Sonoita. And so in the 20s and 30s, for instance, the customs house was located in Ajo and people were expected to kind of, if you cross the border to come into Ajo to check in with customs. I wanna share this image next. which is a, a repeat photography pair of the Ajo Plaza. Um, the Ajo Plaza was built in the 19 teens and it still is uh, more or less the anchor to the town. Um, this is a, a re-photo that a friend of mine uh, took and made, um, Jason Rayner. And uh, the view in the top is from the 19 teens and the view in the bottom is from the uh, 20 teens, 2010s. And the plaza was built by the mining company. The Anglo owned uh, and operated mining company. And it was of course built in this sort of Spanish colonial style, uh, arguably to evoke a sense of place within the border region. Uh, but the great irony, of course, is that the creation of this town uh, came on the heels of the, the quite literal destruction of Ajo. Uh, before copper mining was the big industry that it is in Ajo today, uh, there was copper mining on a much smaller scale in a community called Ajo that was located in what used to be a series of mountains just to the south and west of town here. And so when the Anglo mine company came in and started to develop the open pit and extract copper on an industrial scale, Ajo was quite uh, literally destroyed. They built this new town that initially was called New Cornelia uh, and over the years eventually just took on the name of Ajo. So there really is no Ajo anymore but there is this sort of new creation of the mining company as it was produced in the teens and 20s and 30s and then further expanded in the 50s and 60s uh, that came to take on the identity of what was Ajo. That original settlement of Ajo was located on top of what was a, initially a native settlement. And over the sort of 18th and 19th century became a kind of mixed Spanish and Autumn settlement, Mexican and Autumn settlement uh, until this period in the early 20th century. The plaza itself uh, really is beautiful uh, today uh, in town and it kind of anchors the town and some of the fledgling sort of arts industry and arts community in Ajo. Um, but it perhaps like all landscapes sort of concealed as much as it revealed, as Don Mitchell might say. Uh, the plaza was the anchor to the American town site. And there were separate town sites known as Mexican town and Indian village. Uh, throughout the Arizona Sonora borderlands, of course, there was the dual wage system uh, and copper mines and really other industries that paid white U.S. American workers more than Hispanic Mexican workers. Uh, in Ajo, it was sort of built on a sort of three-tiered racial hierarchy. Uh, the highest and best paying jobs going to people deemed American, then Mexican, and then uh, native folks, largely Autumn in those early years. So this was the town that the mining company created with its residential segregation. And that segregation of course was both a reflection of this racial hierarchy in the mines and it was also a kind of spatial or landscape reinforcement of that racial hierarchy. And a racial hierarchy that was imposed really along the lines for the purposes of the production of copper in this particular area. <clears throat> 
Um, despite being examples of the, uh, you know, despite being these kind of spatial or landscape manifestations of the racial hierarchy, uh, the racism uh, that existed within the mine itself in the production of copper, uh, those communities, nevertheless, Mexican town and Indian village, uh, were significant places to the people that lived there. Uh, three or four generations of miners and their families lived in those communities, uh, made place uh, and created vibrant homes in those communities. Um, perhaps in uh, despite some of the more brutal policies in the mine, uh, but perhaps through that struggle and because of that struggle, uh, that kind of deep sense of place sort of was attached to these new communities, Mexican town and Indian village. In the late 1970s, uh, Phelps Dodge had plans to expand the mine uh, even further. And so to do that, they needed to um, remove Mexican town and Indian village, uh, which they did uh, nearly completely. Um, I can show you with my pointer here, Mexican town was located in this area and the community known as Indian village up in here. Uh, hundreds of people lived in these communities, miners and their families, uh, but in the late 70s, those communities were uh, completely dismantled uh, and folks were moved into uh, what had been known as the American town, which was here and some of the newer subdivisions that were built to the north of Ajo out this way. Uh, the mine never expanded, though, um, because uh, in the early 1980s, there was the uh, uh, Arizona-wide uh, strike, copper strike, uh, copper unions, uh, miners unions against Phelps Dodge, and AHA was involved in that strike as well. Um, it was a long and, and brutal affair. Uh, families were really torn apart by this strike, uh, whether your family was sort of on the picket line or whether your family crossed the picket line to go back to work in the mine. Uh, and it ended with the unions being decertified and the mine here at Ajo essentially being closed as Phelps Dodge decided to focus on its other mine properties and particularly mine properties in, in other parts of the world. So the town itself, Ajo, that was built out of the destruction of a much older Ajo uh, with its Mexican town and Indian village, uh, those communities were sort of wiped from the map. Uh, and then the town itself underwent a kind of both real and sort of symbolic destruction uh, when the mine closed and one that it's sort of been um, struggling uh, with ever since the sort of uh, struggle of deindustrialization in a place like Ajo. Okay. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my screen here for a minute and come back to me. <clears throat> So here in Ajo, uh, the community, like I said, um, has really been struggling since the closure of the mine. Uh, not a unique story to Ajo, for sure. Um, but arguably, uh, what has sort of grown up in the, the wake, in the ashes of the mining industry is the border security industry or the border economy the border industrial uh, complex, however you want to characterize it, however you want to describe it. And there's a few ways we can sort of measure that here uh, in Ajo, um, a place like Ajo, which really in the, through the early 1990s had been largely a kind of um, backwater to the larger story of undocumented migration and border crossing. And I suspect that many of us kind of know the general contours of this story and the prevention through deterrence policies that were implemented in the 1990s. The way those policies funneled people away from cities and urban areas, particularly El Paso and San Diego, 
and into the rugged and remote borderlands, um, precisely the kinds of places uh, in Southern Arizona surrounding Ajo. And so for instance, in the early 1990s, in 1994, at the Ajo Border Patrol Station, they apprehended something like 900 people, or rather I should say they made 900 apprehensions of people that were crossing the border in that year without authorization, without documentation. And then only two years later in 1996, that number was 9,000. And then over the course of the 90s and into the early 2000s, that number went up as high as close to 25,000 apprehensions. The number of Border Patrol agents went from really just a small cadre of agents in a couple of trailers here, 10 to 20 agents that were stationed here through the early 1990s to what we have today, which is 500 Border Patrol agents and a new station that can accommodate up to 900 agents. And this new um, industry has a quite heavy impact on the land as well. Um, it's been estimated that in the Cabeza Prieta uh, wildlife refuge, in the wilderness areas alone, there's been some 13,000 miles of new roads and vehicle tracks laid down in the last decade and a half as a result of all the uh, increased enforcement activity and crossing activity in that area. Uh, and when you're here traveling around and you get out into the landscape, uh, you, you see the impacts quite clearly. Not only the increased numbers of sort of roving patrols of border patrol agents, but the new infrastructure, including the surveillance towers and the uh, new radio equipment and forward operating bases uh, and the uh, you know, new road building and things like that. So this new industry has um, a really heavy impact on the land as well. Um, I personally didn't think it could sort of grow any bigger um, back in 2016. Um, I certainly understood that it could, but it seemed as if the, the border and the sort of border security industry had reached a kind of saturation point. That the border, at least at that point, couldn't take any more, couldn't take any more militarization, considering how much had changed, you know, in the late 1990s and early 2000s, in that kind of brief period of a couple of decades. Um, more changes come, a kind of exponential amount of change. And so what I want to do now is uh, show some photos. Um, I'll mostly just kind of scroll through them here uh, of the new border wall construction that's happening uh, just south of Ajo here on the border. So I'm going to go ahead and load those photos and share my screen again, and we'll go ahead and move through them. Oh, and before I do that, uh, I want to acknowledge the photographer. Who is uh, Richard Larn? I just put his name in the chat box. I'm sure some of you know him and I'm sure some of you have probably received uh, these photos he took, but he spent quite a bit of time uh, over this summer, traveling along that stretch of the border in both Mexico and the US, uh, photographing the dramatic landscape changes as a result of the border wall construction. Uh, and so if you're interested in his work, you can, you can look him up. His name's distinctive there. Uh, it's Richard Larn. So I'm going to go ahead and pull those photos up and do a screen share, and I'll scroll through those um, images for you again. Okay, so you should see the list of the photos here. This first one is 
uh, saguaro cactus and the, uh, the old vehicle barrier in the distance. I'll assume everyone can see them. Uh, if, if you can't, if, if my screen's not being shared, just uh, stop me. We can see them. Thanks, Diana. Okay, so uh, let me go ahead and just sort of maximize the view here. And I wanna leave this top bar where Richard's included the captions. Some of you will know uh, some of these areas or they'll give some more context. These are photos that uh, Richard took uh, along this stretch of the border, uh, uh, including Oregon Pipe Cactus National Monument, Cabeza Prieta National Wildlife Refuge, and the Barry Goldwater Bombing Range. So essentially, these photos are kind of a transect from the um, Tohonotham Nation boundary in the Aja Mountains all the way across the border, not quite to Yuma, but to about the Tinajas Altas Mountains. Uh, which are uh, in the Barry Goldwater bombing range. If you know Richard's work, um, what he primarily does is he takes photos of individual desert plants and he returns over the decades to photograph those plants over time. And he has particular plants that he's photographed for 30 years now uh, in the desert area uh, between Sonora and Arizona. And so some of these photos, um, they might look kind of subtle in terms of the changes until you realize that his focus here is on these three particular saguaros that he knows well and he loves. Um, I ran into Richard one time earlier this spring when he was out there taking photos and I asked him you know, what he was doing. And he said, um, he was warning the saguaros to run. So um, I'm not gonna say much. I wanna scroll through these images. Uh, I think they're pretty effective and uh, pretty powerful in their own right. So I'll give um, you know, several seconds for each one and then I'll uh, offer some words at the end here. I don't know how to feel about that. I agree, Kimmy. <laughs> <laughs> 
disgusting. I agree, Maribel. so dividing. Okay. Thank you, Scott. When I first saw those images, I was heartbroken and continue to be heartbroken by them. And, um, you know, Richard has expressed that um, how, how the border does seem to function in this way that it, it can be all that anybody's talking about as it was, you know, in 2017 and 18 about how this current presidential administration made it such an issue. And then there's just something almost doubly offensive about the way it's just sort of been cast off, cast off of the agenda. I mean, it's sort of the worst of, of both worlds in that uh, uh, this sort of destruction sort of continues largely under the radar. And it happens where it happens because these are federal lands, because that's where it's easiest to build not because it appears to be part of some grand enforcement strategy, but these are the places where it's easiest to build the most mileage of wall because it's legally the easiest for the federal government to do it. And these are the most sensitive places uh, where something like this really shouldn't be happening. So I've been thinking about this question of, you know, when 
when did border security, um, the border security industry, the border security economy, whatever we're going to call it, when did it, when did it itself become uh, an agent of landscape change, you know, capable of, of landscape modifications on this kind of scale? Um, you know, I think back to when there were a dozen or 20 border patrol agents here in Ajo, uh, they sort of largely, and this, this is sort of an oversimplification of course, but you can imagine how they sort of operated and existed within the sort of existing landscape constraints of the time. Um, they drove on the sort of same roads that everyone else was driving on, same kind of Jeep tracks and uh, sort of move through the landscape, but a landscape that um, I have to be careful here, but in some sense, in a material kind of way, was not necessarily shaped or produced by the Border Patrol or by the Ajo Border Patrol Station. And then increasingly looking at the landscape today, um, you see how this industry is an agent of landscape change. I mean, those photos for sure, but also in other kinds of ways, um, you know, dramatic and subtle ways sort of across this desert here. So I can't help but think of the open pit here in Ajo and the copper mining industry as an agent of landscape change and everything that came with it, uh, the same sense of destruction and loss, while at the same time, the kind of production of new kinds of places, new kinds of places like Mexican town and Indian village that were like these sites of accommodation and resistance you know, acceptance and challenging of, of the copper industry and the copper, copper economy. And I'm curious what may emerge, what's already emerging in the context of this new industry. Um, I, I increasingly think that it's appropriate to think of it as an extractive industry. One that is essentially producing a whole lot of wealth for people who largely don't live here and the impacts are sort of disproportionately being felt by the people who live here. And I include both the people who are sort of funneled through this system as laborers and workers. It's sort of a tiered division of labor. Being a border patrol agent in the field is probably one of the better jobs. If you're a guide or one of the people that brings people and goods across the border, in a clandestine way, that's another tier of jobs. And then perhaps at the bottom are the continually replenishing sort of force of labor that comes from undocumented Central American migrants and migrants from Southern Mexico that find their way to a place like Sonoita and find their only way to cross the border is by sort of selling their labor, carrying 50 pounds of marijuana across the desert, for instance. It's gonna be one of the most difficult uh, and kind of violent jobs that one can have in this system. And then of course the impact on the land itself is just absolutely enormous. Um, the construction of the wall, uh, the new roads, the new infrastructure, uh, it leaves a heavy, heavy imprint on the land itself, uh, not unlike copper mining. I appreciate all of the comments in the chat as well. Um, I want to uh, transition to my last set of images here. Uh, and uh, these images are really kind of an acknowledgement of uh, this year in particular. Um, you may have heard, but this is uh, shaping up to be uh, one of the uh, deadliest years that we know of um, for people crossing the border in Arizona. Uh, it's a, a measure, well, the measure comes from the, the numbers of people who are recovered from the desert, people who have died in the desert. Um, but this year is shaping up to be um, 
one of the deadliest years in the last decade. Let me share some images here as a way of transitioning out. Sort of, um, I wouldn't say overlooked, but overshadowed by uh, the felony prosecution that I was involved in, uh, where I was arrested along with um, Jose and Christian, two men from Central America, um, was the, the misdemeanor case that I was involved in. Uh, and that uh, stemmed from uh, work that we were doing uh, here in the Growler Valley, which is just west of Ajo. Uh, the Growler Valley is this kind of massive uh, open valley, probably about 15 miles across uh, and runs a good 40 miles uh, from north to south virtually from almost from the Gila River in the north all the way uh, down to uh, almost, you know, what is now the US-Mexico border. Um, it's long been an important thoroughfare. The valley is full of, um, you know, shells and potsherds and those kinds of things um, from an earlier migration through this area. And uh, it continues to be a major corridor that people travel through. There's a, a kind of a nub of a mountain there uh, on the right hand side, which is known on the maps as uh, Sheep's Peak. And uh, folks who are crossing know it as La Aguja or the needle for its sort of distinctive shape. And um, this is one of the areas that we uh, receive the most sort of search and rescue calls. So family members who are searching for their uh, missing loved ones, who, for instance, they know they crossed the Sonoita border. They don't know where exactly, but just somewhere in that area. Um, and they, you know, uh, maybe heard something about them taking a route through the, the valley of the Aguja, for instance, uh, because it's such a distinctive landmark. Or people who have crossed through this area themselves and have used that landmark as a reference point for navigation. Perhaps they've had to leave somebody behind or they pass the body of someone who had died. And so they'll get in touch with one of these organizations, like No More Deaths, like Aguilas del Desierto and others that do this kind of work. These are the civilian non-governmental organizations. So this area in particular um, has been kind of the locus, I would say, uh, in, in the Ajo corridor where I live of this crisis of death and disappearance in the last um, several years. The valley itself is within the Cabeza Prieto wilderness area. It's full of vehicle tracks from Border Patrol driving around, but our access is primarily limited to, to where we can walk and where we can hike. Um, this was also the area that several of our volunteers, including me, uh, were cited for littering, uh, for leaving water jugs behind uh, on this, uh, uh, this route through the, the Growler Valley, the La Aguja route. There seems to be actually an intensity of cases of where people have become sick, fallen ill and died. Uh, in this particular area, this is the Charlie Bell area. Um, this is actually taken from a spot just right about where I got stopped uh, and cited by uh, Fish and Wildlife law enforcement back in 2017, in the summer of 2017. Um, in this small area, we've encountered you know, people who have, have died um, frequently over and over in the same places. We'll find somebody We'll recover them. Uh, and then the next season, it seems somebody will have died. 
in the same spot. Uh, and so the landscape itself is very troublingly and disturbingly sort of layered, you know, with the traces of people who have passed through here. And here in particular, uh, in this sort of much more confined uh, tight space uh, in this bowl, um, just below Sheep Peak, just below Aguja. To the right is Growler Peak. Um, this has been a particular, a particularly bad spot uh, where the bodies of many people have been recovered and continue to be recovered. I want to sort of leave with this point, um, with this observation, um, and one that, of course, is um, a heavy, a heavy note, a heavy place to end on, um, and a difficult place to end on. And we all have different sort of exposures to this issue. For some of us. It's largely an academic issue for others of us. These are our family and friends and loved ones and acquaintances that we're talking about, people who have died in these places. I think it's also worth though honoring a place like this and honoring the people who have come through here and the people who have died here. Um, it's not for us to, I think, attach a meaning to their life and their experience. That's for them and their family of what happened here. But there is a way, I think, that for me at least, and I know for many others who travel through this area, as migrants, as people who are doing you know, volunteer work and others, you know, that their presence sort of continues and persists in these places uh, long after their remains are gone. And I think that's one of the most important things that we can do as we move forward, regardless of what happens with the wall and what happens politically, what may change, what may stay the same. Sort of this process of, of uh, acknowledging them, of grieving for them, and sort of honoring them and the place um, that they are a part of and will always be a part of uh, feels to me like, like a worthy thing to do. Okay, so with that, I'll say thanks for listening. Uh, thanks for looking at those photos. Uh, it's an honor to share uh, Richard's photos with you uh, and um, be delighted to hear from, uh, from y'all questions, observations, and your own thoughts. Thanks.